I'm going to start off by saying that one of the most significant of the social changes in our modern era has been the emergence and growth of the women's movement, known in many circles as the feminist movement. We have witnessed the unequivocal success shown by women in all walks of life, especially in recent decades. Uh, two representative examples from my own observation are the steadily rising presence of women as major television commentators, uh, as well as those in science and in the medical profession. Tonight, our, uh, our own society vice president, Ann Barrett, will describe how the women's movement took place, tracing its earliest beginnings in colonial America and following it to a large extent uh, up to the period of the 1920s. And of course, Let's see what she means by those first words in the title of her talk, Short Skirts, Oh My, The Evolution of the Women's Movement. And Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, this was a very fun presentation to put together and a very interesting one. And it really kind of covers um, a lot of information about how we got to where we got to, at least from the early part of it some of the fascinating things that happened. So, the 1920s uh, represented an exciting new time for women, with new freedoms and opportunities so greatly expanded from what women had ever known before that they could have hardly been imagined by their grandmothers or possibly even their mothers. In the 1920s, conservative opinion declared that women had changed, become something completely different than they had ever been before. They said that women were at the vortex of a fiery revolution of youth. Um, they bobbed their hair, they shortened their skirts, they stuck bootleg gin in their garters, and they danced until the wee hours of the morning. In general, they thumbed their noses at the dull, conventional worlds of their mothers and turned their backs on old American uh, virtues. These are easy generalizations that were passed down to us. But like all sweeping characterizations, um, you know, there's more to the story than that. One essential correction is that it's, an, um, it's the, out of, uh, the simplified version of the out of control woman in the 1920s, and that all of a sudden this happened. Well, actually, it wasn't all that sudden. American women did not start to make themselves over because of the rumble seat and the purported uses of the rumble seat. <laughs> Nor did they um, make themselves over uh, because of the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote. Yes, the last decade or so had seen an enormous amount of change, but actually women had been changing for really much longer, decades. Um, for decades they had been seeing themselves in a new life and seeking to carve out a new place for women in society and in the great scheme of things. So we're going to journey through the decades leading up to this revolution, starting at a time when skirts were long, opportunities were short. Back to a time when women's roles were traditional and their dreams were not yet realized. In 1776, Abigail Adams is known to have written to her husband John, who was then serving in the Continental Congress, and she said, I long to hear that you have an attendant, that you, what we have uh, declared an independence. And, by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to write, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> John wrote back, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. Rights were very limited for women. Before the Married Woman's Property Act of 1848, a married woman could not control her own property, even if her property and assets had belonged solely to her before her marriage. Before 1848, some states uh, gave more, made small amendments and gave more rights to women, even back into the 17th and 18th centuries. But by and large, a woman's rights were very limited. Of course, there are always exceptions. As a single woman of property in Maryland in the mid-18th century, Margaret Brent, um, with an illustration here on your left, 
left, uh, she appeared before the provincial court uh, to file suits against her debtors and also uh, argued cases on behalf of her brother. She was controversial, but a powerful figure, and no doubt there were other isolated cases of this that have just passed from history and we no longer hear of. In 1756, Lydia Taft became the first le woman legally uh, allowed to vote in colonial America. And this happened because uh, her wealthy husband had passed away, as had her uh, eldest son, leaving the family basically with no heir. So the town of Uxbridge, Massachusetts, voted at town meeting to give her the vote. Deborah Sampson of Plimpton, Massachusetts, pictured on the right, took a different approach uh, when in the problem of being a woman in a man's world. She disguised herself as a young man and presented herself for the American Revolution as Robert Shirtliff. She was wounded. She served for about three years. She was wounded a couple of times, with a, once with a sword, sword cut to the head. Um, another time she was shot through the shoulder. She was not discovered, though, until she came down with brain fever. And the, doc, the attending doctor actually discovered her secret, but he did not say anything. He simply removed her to his own home, where she would receive um, better care. And it's said, or at least there's some legend that says that um, General George Washington, after the revolution was over, actually granted a soldier's pension to her. Education for women took place in their homes or on a limited basis in some schools. And I say limited because, for example, Susan B. Anthony was denied the opportunity to study certain subjects in the school because of her gender. A woman was educated really with an eye to her future role as educator um, to her children. So she was given just basically the basics. She would educate her children with the basic information. And as you see here, you know, here's a um, sampler. You know, your letters and you'll learn to read and your basic um, math kinds of things. But basically, that was it. And she educated her children and then her sons, depending upon the family circumstances, would go on to more schooling after that. It would later be written that the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. I hope you're all quaking then. <laughs> Limited education had historically been a large part of this tyranny. However, in 1821, the Tory Female Seminary was established. It was the first endowed school for women, and it was founded in New York by Emma Willard. Emma was an educator, um, a teacher, and uh, an administrator in her own right when she wrote a pamphlet entitled A Plan for Improving Female Education. She petitioned the state of New York to fund a women's school, uh, but was denied. However, the city of Troy raised $4,000 and agreed to establish the school if Emma would come and lead it, which she did. The education offered was comparable to a college preparatory uh, courses for uh, boys of the time. Uh, it had zoology, natural philosophy, chemistry, uh, things like that. And Emma knew also that some of her students would go on to become wives and mothers, so she also included home management and home economics. Uh, for the courses, some of her courses, if she didn't, if there was no book, she would write the book for the course. And the Troy Female Seminary really became a model for female education. It also proved that women had the ability to learn and excel in all subjects, contrary to what some, and actually quite a few people, believed at the time. Some even questioned the effect of education on a woman's health, as I read here. A girl could study and learn, but she could not do all this and retain uninjured health and a future secure from neuralgia, uterine disease, hysteria, and other derangements of the nervous system, according to Dr. Edward Clark in his widely respected Sex and Education, published in 1873. How many of you have been suffering from these, based upon your education? In 1833, Oberlin College became the first co-educational college in the United States. Now, as we all know, knowledge is power, and women were 
making the first steps on a powerful journey that would last nearly a century. At about the same time in publishing the book, Course of Popular Lectures, Fanny Wright became one of the first women to actually put down on paper and write about women's <coughs> suffrage. She was from Scotland, and she moved to the United States to found a colony, um, which was a socialist colony, uh, that was based upon, she put her, hers in Tennessee, but it was based upon one that she had observed in Indiana. Wright also developed her own dress code for women, which included bodices, um, ankle-length pantaloons, and then a short, like knee-length skirt. This style was later actually promoted by feminists. In her book, she wrote, However novel it may appear, I shall venture the assertion, until women assume the place in society that good sense and good feeling alike assign to them, human improvement must advance but feebly. It is in vain that we would circumscribe the power of one half of our race, and now have, by far, the most important and influential. In 1840, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia, uh, Elizabeth is on the left, and Lucretia Mott met at an international anti-slavery convention in London. And they were outraged when the men of that assembly actually voted to prevent women from speaking at the assembly or even appearing at the assembly. They were um, ordered to an area roped off out of view. This experience galvanized the women into taking further action concerning women's rights. And in 1848, the women's first white women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. Many of the women, uh, many of the women there, signed a Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions that outlined the main issues and objectives for the emerging women's movement. This marked the beginning of regularly held women's rights meetings. Now, try to put yourself in that time and understand that women organizing themselves and acting independently from men was a new concept. And to compare, I actually have this book in my possession. This book was published in 1848, the same year as the Women's Convention. It focuses on the proper behavior of women because up until that time, with the exception of some of the breakaway women that we've discussed, Behavior and reputation and appearance were really all a woman had to rely upon. For example, according to this little book, a lady's behavior in the street must be modest, dignified, yet pleasant and engaging. Never stare, never giggle, never walk with a wiggle or sway from side to side. Ladies are not allowed upon ordinary circumstances to take uh, the arm of any male other than a relative or an accepted suitor. And a question from a st stranger, apart from just the most necessary questions, must be considered a gross insult and repelled with proper spirit. No pickup lines, thank you. <laughs> The Civil War disrupted many suffragist activities as women turned their attention to war work. They served as fund, uh, in fundraising and as nurses. Some even served as spies. Uh, and a few, in disguise, actually served in the war itself. They were also busy running households while their husbands were away for months or even years. Nonetheless, this work provided the opportunity for many women to learn organizational and um, occupational skills that they would be able to use later in suffragist activities. For example, Clara Barton used her, not for suffragists, but Clara Barton used many of her experiences um, to, for, to found the American Red Cross. So they used this knowledge. Now in 1870, the 15th Amendment gave the right to, uh, to vote to the male black population. The disagreement over this, though, caused a split in the American Equal Rights Association, which had been formed in 1866, because that association had been really focused on universal suffrage for white and black women, as well as men.
Stanton and Anthony formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. While Anthony had been a lifelong um, advocate of both anti-slavery and suffrage, um, after the Civil War, she began to focus more and more on the, uh, exclusively on women's rights. Katie and uh, Stanton did not, uh, Stanton and Anthony did not always get along, but it's said that they made a terrific team and um, worked throughout their lives for this cause. Uh, one being a very good writer, the other being a very good orator. So they made a great team together. Lucy Stone from Massachusetts, along with those others, were, uh, established the Boston-based American Women's Suffrage Association. She attended Oberlin and was the first woman in Massachusetts to earn a college degree. She was asked to write a commencement speech, but she actually refused because somebody else would have had to have read the speech. Even though women were going to Overland, they were still barred from making public addresses. In 1850, Stone was a leader in organizing the first uh, National Rights Convention held in Worcester, Mass. Attendees at the 1848 convention in Seneca Falls had been mostly local. But this next convention actually drew women from around, from across the country. Lucy Stone's speech of 1850 is actually credited with really getting Susan B. Anthony onto the cause of women's suffrage. And she's remembered uh, most for one first. She was the first woman in the United States to keep her own name after marriage. While we're talking about Massachusetts women, let me mention Victoria Claflin Woodhull, who is on the left here. She was descended from the Claflin family, uh, which resided over at the Claflin Richards House, uh, which is now owned by the Wenham um, Museum and Historical Society over on Route 1A. During the latter half of the 19th century, she read, led an extremely colorful life. Uh, she was a spiritualist, an actress. She established the first women's stock brokerage. She was an advocate of free love and the first woman to run for president in 1872. She was an advocate for women's rights uh, and the need for reformed divorce laws, but many suffragists shied away from her as feeling that she was too radical. And while she never made it on to any official ballot or anything, she did have posters and she did campaign to be president. The next and only other woman to run for president in the 19th century was Belva Lockwood, pictured on the right, she ran in 1884 and 1888. After that, it would be decades before a woman's name would make it on to the no uh, nomination or ballot papers. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed. And in addition to becoming a powerful voice against the evils of liquor, this organization was also an important force in the fight for suffrage. Not surprisingly, the liquor industry was opposed to women's suffrage because they felt that if women got the vote, that alcohol consumption would be outlawed. In 1878, a women's suffrage amendment was introduced in the United States Con Congress, but it didn't pass. It's interesting to note that many um, individual states, though, had already granted um, some sort of uh, suffrage to women. The all of, all of colored states um, gave women no voting rights. Light orange states, women could vote in the presidential election. The dark orange states, women could vote in primaries. And in the blue states, women had full voting rights. And you notice that most of the blue states are out to the west. And there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, it was a harsh new frontier, and women uh, held more of a role in establishing that and were more equal partners in establishing that frontier. And also, it was quite probably an inducement to induce women to come out and to help establish the frontier, and they would be given full voting rights. But even though some of the states were given um, rights, suffragists felt that nothing short of a constitutional amendment would guarantee them their full rights. In 1890, the organization that had split into two came back together under the direction of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But she resigned from, uh, only a couple of years later because many felt that she was just too radical. Now, you might think that all women would be in favor of having women get the vote, but that wasn't the case. 
1911, the National Association opposed to women's suffrage was organized by a group of wealthy and influential women, uh, as well as some Catholic clergymen. It was further uh, fueled by distillers and brewers, and also conservative southern congressmen, remember those southern states, which were giving no rights to women at that time, and some corporate capitalists. Locally, the February 6, 1912, Salem News declared, when women oppose suffrage. Because here's what happened, what would happen if women could vote. <laughs> Posters and pamphlets proclaimed that ill would result if suffragists were successful. The reasons they gave were many and included no woman who may vote will attend to her domestic duties. And we saw, we saw that's true. It will make dissension between husband and wife. But then in a contradicting statement, men and women are so much alike that men can represent a woman's view. <laughs> I don't know where they live. Um, women will vote, a woman will vote as her husband tells her to. Women will form a solid party and outvote men, which is probably what they're really worried about. <laughs> but here's my favorite. Women have no powers of organization. <laughs> Despite this, in 1912, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party became the first party to adopt a woman's suffrage plank in the bid for presidency. Finally, suffragists were making some serious political headway, but Roosevelt was not elected. Woodrow Wilson became the next president, and he was anti-suffragist. During the early teens, the National Women's Party organized hunger strikes and picketing. And at first, well, Wilson was tolerant of this, but eventually he ordered the protesters jailed where they received much publicized ill treatment. Um, uh, Alice Paul was forced fed with a tube. Um, women were beaten. It became uh, an embarrassment for the White House. And eventually, Wilson um, said, let them go. The United States entered World War I in 1917. And almost immediately, the Wilson administration called on women to support the war effort. Thousands of women volunteered their service. They joined drives to sell uh, war saving stamps and liberty bonds. They sold them in club, at club meetings and on the street and in shops. Others helped the Red Cross to provide medical supplies. And yet others worked with government agencies or other volunteer organizations um, on behalf of the war effort. Thousands of female volunteers had the chance for the first time to uh, wear Red Cross and other uniforms that marked them as people of influence and skill. And they were also able, for the first time, to enlist in certain yeah, capacities and in certain roles uh, in some of the armed services. During the fall of 1917, the United States Employment Service recognized that thousands of women were going to have to go to work in the war industries. Women came out of their homes to do the jobs and provide the service that their country needed. And by the winter of 1917-1918, it was clear that women would have to take over what was thought of as men's work. And you can see the photo here. Women are welding in this photo. Now, of course, in the view of suffragists, the fact that women were being called upon to support the war effort in such very critical ways further reinforced the argument that women should be given voting power. The National American As uh, Suffrage Association, under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, formed a plan to coordinate suffrage lobbying at both the state and federal level. And she used men's tactics of meetings with politicians and leveraging those in favor of suffrage to get them to convince um, their peers to also be in favor of suffrage. In 1918, Wilson finally came around to their point of view and encouraged the House and Senate to pass the amendment, saying that it was an act of right and justice to the women of the country and of the world. However, it still failed to pass. 
But finally, in 1919, it did pass, but needed to be ratified by at least 36 states. 35 states ratified it, and all eyes turned to the state of Tennessee. As you might remember, Tennessee was in those states down there where there were no, um, there was no suffrage for women. The vote looked to be extremely tight with no clear winner, and the fight was on, and it was known as the War of the Roses. Um, those in favor of suffrage wore yellow roses into the chambers, and those opposed wore red roses. The swing vote was in question, and it was held by Harry Byrne, a young representative. And when I say young, he was about 24. His earlier actions and statements had been kind of conflicted, and it seemed likely that he would vote with his constituency against suffrage. And as a matter of fact, he might have done just that had it not been for a letter from his mother. <laughs> <laughs> Feb Byrne was an independent-minded wid widow uh, taking care of the farm in Tennessee, but found time to keep up on the suffrage movement. And she said that recent events and news about the uncertainty of the outcome really finally compelled her to put down on paper and write to her son, voicing her sentiments. Hurrah, and vote for suffrage, and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech, it was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood, but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy, <laughs> and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha, no more from Mama this time with lots of love, Mama. And so, Tennessee became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. Women had finally won the right to vote. So, what happened then? Let's switch gears and talk about fashion and its role as an indicator of the transformation. Between 1900 and the mid-20s, the feminine ideal in America underwent a remarkable and virtually complete metamorphosis. At the turn of the century, the Gibson girl defined the age. The phrase was made popular by Charles Dana Gibson, an illustrator. And it was uh, defined by hair swept up, displaying a high brow and a narrow waist, well-concealed legs, and a wifely and matronly <coughs> appearance and manner. The Gibson girl always appeared aloof and seemingly incapable of any improper thought or immodest deed. She was cultured and intelligent but would not mix in politics with the like. By the 1920s, the Gibson girl had vanished. And in her place was the flapper. It seems that the term flapper referred to a fledgling, fledgling bird, not quite ready to leave the nest. Quite unlike the Gibson girl, the flapper cut off her hair, concealed her forehead, de-emphasized her curves, showed as much leg as possible, and she also wore plenty of makeup, which up until that time really had only been employed by loose women. <laughs> During the first half of the 20s, skirt length became the boiling point of this social revolution. Since 1915, skirts had been drifting up slowly, and shortly after World War I, hems were six to seven inches uh, above the ground. By 1920, it seemed that all restraints had been thrown to the wind, and skirts were up another five to six inches. And the shorter skirt was not the only change in fashion. Uh, overall, clothing just became lightened and simplified. There were no more petticoats and chemises and corsets and all that. In 1928, the Journal of Commerce declared that the amount of uh, fabric or cloth required to make a woman's complete outfit had dropped from 19 and a half yards in 1913 to a mere seven yards in 1928. Almost one third of what, it, what, had been, what they had been using. The 1920s also witnessed an explosion of beauty shops, 5,000 in 1920, 40,000 in 1930. Um, cosmetic sales jumped by 400%. In 1921, the first Miss America pageant took place. 
While women's expanding political opportunities contributed to the sense of the new woman, changes in work were equally important. World War I brought short-term opportunities and variety of work jobs for women and introduced them to this sort of um, working. And in, in addition, new business technologies like stenography and typing also introduced a whole host of new clerical jobs. Well, women flocked to these white-collar jobs. They paid better and had more status. Clerical work became increasingly dominated by women. And um, to that were added clerks and bookkeepers, and they kept expanding. And also, about 88,000 women were working as telephone operators. By something like 1917, women accounted for 99% of all switchboard operators. At the turn of the century, a young working woman either lived at home with her family or she boarded with another family if she couldn't live uh, with her own family. In the 1920s, between school and marriage, young working women lived on their own apartments, often sharing them with other working girls. Having their own apartments gave women this sense of autonomy and adulthood and of being unsupervised and unrestrained. It gave their parents a lot of worry. For a good reason. <laughs> Jazz was all the rage. In the newspaper, the New York American reported its results on the national character, saying, moral disaster is coming to hundreds of young American women through the pathological, nerve-irritating, sex-exciting music of jazz orchestras. <laughs> in just two years in Chicago alone, the organization, the Illinois Vigilance Association, reported the downfall of a thousand girls could be traced directly to the pernicious influence of jazz music. A social worker reported on the unwholesome excitement she now encountered even at small town Midwest dances. Boy and girl couples left the hall in a state of dangerous disturbance. <laughs> Bathtub gin combined with jumpy jazz music, suggestive couples dancing, short skirts, all led to a new era of relaxed sexual norms. Rudolph Valentino made millions of women swoon. Chic condoms, which are pictured here actually, held all the promise of romantic Valentino-esque liaisons. One father of the time described his experience thus. I was sure my girls had never experimented with hip pocket flask, flirted with other women's with other women's husbands, or smoked cigarettes. My wife entertained the same smug delusion and was saying something like that out loud at the dinner table one day. And then she began to talk about a girl my daughter associated with, saying, "They tell me that Purvis girl has cigarette parties at her home." My daughter Elizabeth was regarding her mother with curious eyes. She made no reply, but turning to me right there at the table, she said, Dad, let's see your cigarettes. Without the slightest suspicion of what was forthcoming, I threw Elizabeth my cigarettes. She withdrew one from the package, tapped it on the back of her left hand, inserted it between her lips, reached over, and took my lighted cigarette from my mouth, lit her own cigarette, and blew airy rings toward the ceiling. <laughs> My wife nearly fell out of her chair, and I might have fallen out of mine if I hadn't been momentarily too stunned. <laughs> <laughs> Young working women often modeled their behavior and their dreams on the movies, and in the 1920s, movie stars took over from business, artistic, or political leaders as being role models. Ironically, the movies were taking their themes from these young working women who made up a large, a large part of their audience. Films showed office workers and department store clerks who were working amid wealthy bosses and customers. And kind of the idea was, through spunking cleverness, you could use your position to marry the boss. In 1928, 39% of college graduates were women, which was up from 19% at the turn of the century. That same year, women began to uh, compete in track and field events at the Olympics. Women had not competed at the first Olympics in 1896, the opinion being that their competition would be, and I quote, impractical, 
uninteresting, unesthetic, and incorrect. They began competing in 1900 in lawn tennis and golf. Women's swimming was added in 1912, but American women did not compete in that first event because um, American women were banned from competing without, uh, in any event, without a long skirt. It's hard to swim in a skirt. <laughs> So throughout the Roaring Twenties, women were enjoying new freedoms, work opportunities, and the robust pros prosperity of the decade. And what did all this freedom and freedom quality look like? Well, let's take a look. Thank you. 